The Vape Passion Show, episode 86. In this week's episode, an e-juice review of Grape Drank by Ruthless. San Francisco's vape ban is going to a public vote in 2018. Researchers try to replicate the infamous formaldehyde study but can't. Preparing for a natural disaster when you're a vapor. And the FDA is asking vape manufacturers to submit their trade secrets. Hey, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. I'm Alex, this is episode 86, and I'm recording this on Monday, September 11th. If you're planning on buying a vape product anytime soon and you want to support the show, go to vapepassion.com slash vendors and buy from one of those links. There are more than 50 popular vendors listed. I'll get a small commission for referring you, but it doesn't cost you anything extra. And if you don't want to listen to the whole show, most of the segments will be published separately in the next few days. This week's episode is probably going to be a little later than usual, so I apologize for that. But with my wife going to school, me having to work from home three days per week to watch my daughter, and me starting a new semester in school, life has been more hectic than I think it has ever been in my entire life. I've been so busy that I feel like I never get a resting moment. I did get to play 30 minutes of Rise of the Tomb Raider on the Xbox One this weekend, though, so that was cool. Actually, I did get to have a little fun this weekend. We went to an annual festival in a nearby town that we've been going to every year for the last few years. Uh, they have lots of booths with people selling things, a bunch of bouncy castles for kids, a little train for kids, food trucks, a chili cook-off, and live bands. Uh, we were there for like four hours, and then the rest of the day and rest of Sunday was dedicated to homework, chores, and spending time with my daughter as much as, as possible while trying to work. So yeah, that was my weekend. And I want to give you all a little reminder about the giveaway that I'm running for two OBS engine sub tanks. If you want to enter, uh, just go to vapepassion.com slash giveaways and you'll find the link. As far as vape stuff goes, I finished my review of the Asvape Cobra sub ohm tank. That should be up on my YouTube channel by the time you listen to this. And I published a review of the PAX Jewel device, so go check that out. I didn't get much for vape gear this past week, uh, just two bottles of e-juice. I got a bottle of Lost Fog Neon Cream. That's an orange, raspberry, and lemon lime sherbet flavor. I haven't tried it yet, but it sounds really good. And I also got a bottle of Ruthless Grape Drink. And that's actually the juice, the e-juice that I'm going to discuss in this week's show. So let's jump right into that review. I've actually reviewed Grape Drank before, but it's the number one video that I get crap for, mainly for vaping it at only 10 to 20 watts. Uh, I published it in January 2016, but it was actually recorded in May 2015, right after I bought my first RDA, the Smoke Caterpillar. That's how I was vaping two years ago, and how a lot of people were still vaping. Uh, sub ohm vaping at 100 watts or higher wasn't a thing yet. This was a time when people thought 60 watts was high. I think Grape Drank is such a popular e-juice even today, which says a lot, but it's still so popular that a lot of people find my old review not realizing how long ago it was recorded. And a lot of these people probably weren't vaping two to three years ago, and they don't realize how different the products were back then. I regularly get comments of people making fun of how low I was vaping, to which I usually respond that it was a different time, and then they usually delete their comment. But anyway, today I'm doing an update. So Grape Drank is described by Ruthless as grape soda and grape candy. Ruthless used to say that it tasted like grape skittles, but they probably changed it to grape candy before they got in trouble. And I see that they have a new label now, which looks nice. In my original review, I thought that grape drink tasted like grape soda, but not candy. And it had a really strong perfume taste. After coming back to it a month later, the perfume taste went away completely. Grape drink is pre-steep, so it shouldn't have that problem, but it did. And I think it just wasn't pre-steep long enough. And it's not just me. This is another common comment that I get from people on this video. They think it tastes like perfume too. So let's see if anything has changed. I'm using the Asvape Michael mod with a Goon 1.5 RDA on top, built at 0.29 ohms, 90 watts. It smells like I remember it. I haven't had this e-juice in a long time. It smells like grape soda. Um, I still don't get that candy smell out of it. All right, at 0.29 ohms, I had to raise the wattage a little bit. I'm at 125 now. So yeah, it tastes just like I remember it. Um, after, it got better. It doesn't have any perfume taste this time. I don't know if they've... Uh, I just got a bottle that's been steeped a little bit longer, or if they've uh, if they pre-steep longer now, I don't know. But yeah, it tastes like a like a grape soda, like grape Fanta, uh, just like I said in the last review. Um, I still don't get much of a candy taste, but it tastes grape and tastes really good, really sweet too. And I got six milligrams of nicotine; it's not harsh. And originally, when that perfumey taste went away, this ended up being my favorite e-juice, one of my favorite e-juices, and. Uh, it's still one of my favorites. This is It's a really good e-juice. But I want to point out that this is one of those love it or hate it e-juices. Some people think it tastes like medicine, and some people say it tastes like grape soda. So if you do buy it and you don't like it, don't say I didn't warn you. So Grape Drink is a 85 VG 15 PG e-juice. It's available in nicotine strengths of 0, 3, 6, 12, and 18. And you can get it in bottle sizes of 15, 30, 60, and 120 mils. You can find it on sale for around $8 for a 15 mil bottle, so it's not too bad. Just make sure you look for a sale, because suggested retail is... 
kind of expensive. So. Okay, now for some news out of San Francisco. Back in June 2017, San Francisco's Board of Supervisors passed a ban on flavored tobacco products. And since electronic cigarettes are technically considered tobacco products, this basically translates to a full ban of selling e-juices in San Francisco, which will take effect on April 1st, 2018. San Francisco residents will still be able to buy e-juice online from stores outside of the city, but no local vape shops will be allowed to sell e-juice. This will most likely put most, if not all, brick and mortar shops in San Francisco out of business. Many people and businesses have been opposed to the board's decision, which has resulted in the formation of a committee called Let's Be Real San Francisco. Let's Be Real San Francisco includes the Arab American Grocers Association, the National Association of Tobacco Outlets, and many vape product companies. The committee was formed to fight the ban and has already collected $600,000 in monetary contributions and $85,000 in non-monetary. Most of this was contributed by R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. In late July, the law firm Nielsen Merksamer submitted a referendum to strike down the ban, and they were given 30 days to collect 19,000 signatures in their support. In the beginning, it seemed like an impossible target, but as of the deadline, they had already received 33,900 signatures, far above their goal. The San Francisco board could have decided to drop the decision, but they've chosen to ignore the petition. That means the, the ban will now go on to next year's ballot for voters to vote on. If you live in San Francisco, you can expect a lot of campaigning to take place, both from anti-vaping and pro-vaping groups. This is going to be a tough one, especially in San Francisco. Vaping groups have a lot of work ahead of them, but it's not impossible. There's nine months to go, and a lot can change in that time. The new stance that the FDA is taking in support of e-cigs as a harm reduction tool could start to reach a wider audience, and maybe even sway the general public's opinion of vaping. All right, now let's talk science and research. Just about everyone is familiar with the famous formaldehyde study. Uh, that's prob probably the biggest and most well-known study ever done on vaping. It's brought up at least once a week on popular vaping groups uh, fa on Facebook and online forums, despite it having been debunked many times and in many ways. If you're not familiar with it, the study was published by the New England Journal of Medicine in early 2015. The researchers found that in their tests, vaping produced large amounts of formaldehyde, which is a known carcinogen. It turned out that the researchers didn't understand how vaping worked. They used a low quality CE4 atomizer with a 2.1 ohm coil hitting it at 5 volts for 4 second puffs every 30 seconds. They were heating the atomizers to the point of the wicks drying out and burning, which no person would ever do in real life. This study came out right when vaping was really starting to take off. To most people, vaping was still fairly new, even to researchers. And the researchers in that study used methods that were entirely unrealistic. Then they published the results for the media to go nuts with, and it worked. The media jumped on it and ran stories everywhere about how vaping could be even more dangerous than smoking. The vape community and many scientists quickly pointed out the errors in the study, but the authors ignored it and the damage was done. That's the basic history of it. But now, a new study has come out that directly dispels the formaldehyde myth. Researchers with the Onassis Cardiac Surgery Center, University of Patras, and the National School of Public Health in Greece performed a replication study. The research team includes the well-known vaping advocate, Dr. Konstantinos Varsalinos. They use the same equipment and e-liquid, uh, the same puff duration, and the same voltage settings. 88% of the time, dry puffs were recorded at around 4.2 volts, so the researchers determined 4 volts to be the maximum realistic setting that a person would use. That's far from the 5 volts that the original team used, and is still much higher than a vapor would typically use with that specific setup. Farsalinos found that formaldehyde was detected at as low as 3.3 volts, and at much higher levels at around 4 volts. Using this equipment, the daily exposure of consuming 3 grams of e-liquid, or about 3 mils, is 32% lower than smoking an entire pack of 20 cigarettes. Interestingly, Farsalinos used real people in the study, and what's funny is that none of the participants were willing to try the setup at 5 volts because they knew how bad of a dry hit they would get. I'd be really interested to see what kind of results researchers would get with the devices that we use today. Anyway, hopefully this settles it once and for all. Okay, let's change subjects and talk about prepping and vaping. I want to start out by saying that this segment has nothing to do with prepping as far as food, water, heat, and sanitation is concerned. I'm not a prepper, and if doomsday happened, I'd probably be one of the first people to die. Well, I might live to season two of The Walking Dead, but probably not much longer. Anyway, I'll only be talking about how, it, how to prepare for a disaster as it relates to vaping. As for the other stuff, you'll need to figure that out on your own. So with Hurricane Harvey finished, and Hurricane Irma probably down to a Category 1 storm by the time you listen to this, this advice is a little too late for anyone who has suffered through these recent natural disasters. But things like this will happen again, and it's never too soon to prepare for a future disaster. In the case of most major natural disasters like floods, earthquakes, and tornadoes, the biggest issue you're likely to run into as a vapor is that you won't have electricity. Since electricity is a necessity for charging your batteries, it's obviously pretty important for vaping. And it doesn't need to be a natural disaster either. Uh, some places around the world have to deal with rolling blackouts due to the inability to keep up with energy demands 
or a major electrical line in your neighborhood might go down or it might even be that you get an overnight power power failure for some people even small power outages without a fully charged e-cig can result in smoking a cigarette so what can you do first i'd recommend getting several sets of batteries having multiple devices ready if you need them and charging everything up fully that's a good start many preppers go all out and buy generators such as portable models that can cost around 300 to 400 dollars that can keep your fridge and other appliances running or more powerful models that can power your whole house for a thousand or two thousand dollars or more that's a pretty big investment if you just need something for small electronics you can go get a small generator for as low as 130 dollars that can provide a thousand watts of electricity it won't power a fridge but it's more than enough to run several light sources power radios and run battery chargers just remember that these need to be kept outdoors usually since they will cause carbon monoxide or CO2 poisoning if it's running in your house. If you have access to an automobile and you're able to turn it on, that's another source of temporary electricity. You can get a power inverter that plugs into the car's cigarette lighter that will turn the car's DC power into AC power. The inverter has plugs just like you'd find on the walls in your house. You can get those for anywhere between $20 to $40 at places like Target and Walmart and they work great. I actually use one of these every time we travel to visit my wife's family because it takes about two hours to get there, so I plug in my laptop and I get work done while I'm on the road. Another option is to buy portable power banks. Power banks typically have large batteries or multiple sets of batteries that allow it to store a lot of energy. For example, I've seen one on Amazon that holds 20,000 milliamp hours of charge and it has two USB ports so that you can plug in your phone or other USB rechargeable devices. You can get large 20,000 milliamp hour models for around $40 or smaller models for less than $20, depending on your needs. You can also find power banks that have solar chargers built in so that they can constantly charge back up. And finally, while on the subject of solar energy, consider buying a solar charger. You can find foldable solar panels that have USB ports built in that provide around 16 to 22 watts. Something like this would take a long time to charge a large vape device, but it can be used to charge smaller devices or even store power to refill external power banks. In a situation where you're without power, try to conserve as much po as possible so that you have it for when you really need it. For example, instead of using your flashlights all the time, consider using candles and matches or hand crank or solar lanterns. Personally, I would have a hard time justifying the use of power banks for vape gear when they should be used for things like cell phones and radios, but hey, if you've got enough of them, it might not be a big deal. Okay, so that's all I've got for external power. Now let's talk about the other stuff. Uh, let's start with e-juice. So you obviously need enough e-juice to get you through a, a period of time where none will be accessible, uh, maybe enough for a couple of days or even a few weeks. It can get a little pricey to stock up on that much e-juice all at once, but if you have the cash, go for it. If you don't have that kind of money, go for the basic necessities. You can get a gallon of vegetable glycerin for $30, 250 mils of nicotine for $25, and then you can just reuse your old e-juice bottles. That'll last months or even longer. If you want to spend a little extra, you can get some clean bottles for a few bucks and a few flavors for $1 to $3 each. And you can mix these up in bulk and have them ready if you need them. In the case of flooding, such as with the hurricanes, you need to keep your e-juice bottles and ingredients in waterproof containers. If they are underwater, they will get contaminated and you won't be able to uh, vape them safely. Uh, you can buy waterproof containers for around $20 from Amazon or large waterproof duffel bags from places like cabelas.com for $120. Bucks. And one tip that I've seen showing up on Facebook lately is to store important items items in your dishwasher since dishwashers lock tight and are waterproof this is not true in a flooding situation your dishwasher will fill with dirty water and mud too so don't do it all right so all that's left is the other stuff like atomizers cotton coil and building tools if you're in an emergency i think rebuilding will probably be the least of your worries but if you must have these things just make sure they're in a bag ready to go and maybe also in a waterproof bag if there might be flooding so i think that's about it if you have any extra tips to add uh please let me know i can always update my blog post with any tips that i get i can't update this video but people can see your comments so it's still helpful and for all of you out there going through right now i wish you the best and i hope you and your family are okay and safe and one final topic this week the fda is asking bait manufacturers to submit their trade secrets last week on september 6th mitch zeller published a blog post on the fda voice blog encouraging tobacco companies including eg's manufacturers to submit documents that contain trade secrets this document is called the Tobacco Product Master File, or TPMF. This is a voluntary submission that would benefit the industry as a whole, or at least that's the idea behind it. The TPMF usually contains trade secrets and confidential information about the company's tobacco products, stuff they wouldn't want the public or competitors to see. Once submitted to the FDA, the owner can grant permission to other companies to reference their master file when making their own submissions to the FDA. 
uh, once permissions are granted, these other parties are still not able to see the, confident, the confidential information in the master file, but the FDA is. Mitch Zeller provided an example of how this might work with a flavor manufacturer. In his example, a flavor manufacturer could submit a master file with a full listing of, of ingredients and composition for each of their flavors. One of their customers could then be given the right to reference that master file in their pre-market tobacco application. You can see how this would be beneficial. Let's say the Flavor Apprentice, TFA, submitted master files for all of their flavor concentrates. Any e-juice manufacturer who uses TFA's flavorings in their e-juices could ask TFA for permission to use their master file. And why wouldn't TFA want to help their customers get their products approved by the FDA? It's a win-win situation. This saves the e-juice manufacturer time and money because then they won't have to pay to get their own tests done. Uh, these tests are far too expensive for a small company to do anyway, so this can actually help prevent small e-juice companies from going out of business. Submitting master files could also be a smart business decision for ingredient manufacturers. Let's say that TFA decided not to submit their master files, but real flavors did. If I was making e-juice, I would use real flavors since they would have the master files that I need to get my product approved by the FDA. And the same thing goes for manufacturers of VG, PG, sweeteners, food colorings, and nicotine. According to the FDA, master files can be referenced in pre-market tobacco applications, substantial equivalence reports, modified risk tobacco product applications, and other types of submissions. A company can submit a master file at any time, but the FDA will not review them until they were referenced in a submission. The big question now, though, is if any companies are going to submit master files. From what I can tell, this could be the start of making the PMTA process affordable. Rather than costing millions of dollars per product submission over time, time and with enough master files in the FDA system, a PMTA might cost only a small fraction of that. Okay, that's all I got for this week. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 86. If you want to support this show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion and I'm also on Facebook. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of this show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews, or of this show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me or leave a comment on one of my videos. All right, I'll see you next week.